Hey, Pastor Carl here. Thank you so much for joining us online. We pray that you are refreshed and encouraged as we dive into God's word together today. Joe, I am one of the pastors here and we are, I'm glad to be here. Um, we are starting this series in Advent, as Pastor David said, um, and this morning I have been tasked with the, uh, to talk about the gift of hope. As we look at uh, Advent, the, the God gives us his one and only son, um, and he comes and he is with us, that there's a whole lot of things that come along with that. And as followers of Jesus, we have been uh, given this gift of hope. Advent is all about anticipating the coming of Jesus, and we look back toward to Jesus' first coming, and we look forward to his second coming. That's what this whole Advent season is about. And this morning, as we talk about hope, we talk about this choice to wait with anticipation. Big idea for this morning is that as followers of Jesus, we have hope because God will do what he says that he will do. That's the big idea. God will do what he says that he will do. Let's pray, and then we will get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, for, thank you for your people. Thank you for technological advances like the internet where we can find videos like this that encourage us, that teach us things about hope and more about who you are. God, even as we, as we think about the, the writers of the scriptures and how they have told us this story, we, we know that we lean on them, that we lean most importantly on you. God, we know that you want to speak to us, that you have desires and dreams for us. As we are in this season of waiting, God, would you, would you teach us to have hope? God, as we slow down a bit, as we slow down to contemplate and to think about you becoming a human, being born, breathing the very air that your breath sustains, God, would the, the implications of this seep deep into the core of who we are? So God, would you be speaking to us this morning, teaching us more about who you are and who you, who you say that we are and what in the world that means. Give us ears to hear. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 2, if you have been around the church for any period of time, you probably will recognize this story starting in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chiefs, priests, and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summons the wise men and sends them and says, when you have found this child, come back that I may worship him also. This is a very interesting story as we have these non-Jewish people from the east that we don't know a whole lot about searching for this king that has been born of the Jews. But that's not specifically what I want to look at this morning. What I want to look at is the prophets that they quote from. So Herod uh, has these, these people, these random strangers that come to him and say, where is the king who has been born? And he says, I, I don't know. He's not here, I can tell you that. And so he brings together all the chief scribes and the, and the priests, and he, they, they consult with the Old Testament. They do some digging, and they quote from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and say, oh, it's in Bethlehem. That's where the Messiah is to be born. So why don't you go and check it out, 
and then we will go from there. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And while this might be the first time that these wise men have asked this question, this question had been being asked for a long time. Because God had been, been, been promising a king that would come for a long time. This starts way back in the beginning of Genesis chapter 3 after Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit that they were not supposed to eat from and have fractured their relationship with God. Immediately after, God says that there will be an offspring that will come from Eve that will crush this snake. This snake crusher is coming. And then a few Hundred or thousand of years, thousands of years later, depending on who you talk to, Moses is on the scene and he's writing the book of Deuteronomy and he's talking about how there's this prophet that is coming, a greater prophet than he that was coming. And then they get to the promised land where this king named David is ruling and reigning and he's doing all of these good things and God comes to him and gives him these promises. Second Samuel chapter 7 Verse 12, God promising to David says, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, a temple for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And as we unpack this a little bit, we get this idea that this son of David will rule and reign forever. And this idea, this idea becomes a huge rallying point for the people of Israel. Because Israel under David's kingship is kind of like America in the 40s and 50s. It's the golden years. Everything is wonderful. And so as the nation of Israel continues on their journey, they get to some places where they say, I want to go back to that. When things were prosperous and we were able to govern ourselves and we obeyed God's commandments that we had a king like David... And so they look forward with anticipation for this son of David to come who will rule and reign forever. Fast forward a few decades and hundreds of years later, the prophets show up, these people who speak on behalf of God, and they shed more light on this coming prophet king and what he will do this idea is everywhere in the Old Testament. It's almost like it's, it's building this idea and then it culminates with what we understand to be the person and work of Jesus. This idea of this king, this redeemer, this prophet, this rescuer who is coming is built into the fabric of the entire Old Testament. Whether it's stated obviously or it's hinted at, it is very much there. And so this question becomes, where is the king? Where is the king? Where is he? When is he coming? Where is the king? And as this question is asked, the people of Israel get very good at waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting some more. And sometimes this waiting comes in different forms. Sometimes, like in the book of Lamentations, written by the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 3, he says, Remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are like new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And sometimes we feel like that, don't we? When things are, are going very poorly or there's stress or whatever it may be, things aren't good, we're able to say, and not just say, but feel in our bones, I have hope. Because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Great is your faithfulness. Praise God when that happens, right? That, this, that the response that we have to these, these circumstances is one of trust and faith and hope. 
And we see that at times the people of Israel have that type of response, but sometimes the response is a bit different. Like in Psalm 89, verses 46 through 51, where the psalmist writes, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Lord, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? How long? How long is it going to be like this? God, where are you? Sometimes we ask that question too. And this question isn't new because waiting is hard and it's complicated. Especially for us where we live in a world with drive throughs and high-speed internet and we don't like to wait for anything. We want it and we want it now, but when we are forced to wait, waiting is hard and it's complicated but humanity has been waiting for this snake crusher, this offspring of Eve since Genesis chapter 3. Israel has been waiting for this son of David to come who will rule and reign for all of eternity since those golden years. And events and time, they continue as they wait for this king, asking the question, where is he? Where is the king? And eventually the nation of Israel, God's people, are sent into exile when they are conquered by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. They lose their promised land. They lose the temple where they could go and meet with God. And some even lose their hope. They say things like, I don't know how... God is going to make good on any of these promises anymore. Maybe God has abandoned us. How long, O oh Lord, if you are even listening anymore? And it's within this hopeless situation of the exile where they're not only far from the land that God had promised to them, but far from God himself that God raises up this prophet named Jeremiah who says, behold, the days are coming to the people in exile. Says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. And there's this glimmer of hope. Maybe God is still with us. But then even when they end up going back to their land, they continue to be a conquered people. They're conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and then the Persians who let them go back to Israel. But then the Greeks come and they take over and then the Romans, they aren't a kingdom that can govern themselves and they certainly don't have a king, not a king like David. And so they wait. God, what's the deal? What is taking so long? Have you forgotten about us? There's this feeling of hopelessness. But God's promises to David still continue to give them hope. This mixed emotion of hopelessness and hopefulness as they wait. And then these magi, these wise men, show up in Jerusalem Say, where is this king who has been born king of the Jews? And they go and they worship this baby in a manger, this long-awaited king. And as we read through the story of Jesus in the Gospels and then into the New Testament, we see that Jesus fulfills all of the prophecy, all of the promises that God made. The Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they give us tons of examples. They're painting Jesus in this in subtle ways and in not so subtle ways that of him as the Messiah, as this promised king that would come. When you're reading your Bibles, this one's free. When you're reading your Bibles, check the footnotes. Check the footnotes because this is incredibly important. Even when you're reading Matthew chapter 2, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, but from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
cool, that's from some prophet. But if you look at the footnote, you see it's from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You can go back and you can read that and you start to see how Jesus fulfills these promises. How he's born of a virgin. He's born in Bethlehem from the line of David. This son of David, this king that would come. Even the way that Jesus talks about himself as the son of man is from Daniel chapter 7, this, this poetic poem of this exalted human being who does things that are only reserved for God. And then in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus is talking to his disciples after he has been crucified, buried, and then raised again. He is having this conversation. He says, these are my words when I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now there's a lot to this, but he's saying that the entirety of the Old Testament is pointing toward me and I have fulfilled all of these things. This is why, the, this is one of the reasons that the Old Testament is so incredibly important It all points forward to Jesus. It's within this context, the context of the Old Testament, that that Jesus makes any sort of sense at all. We can't unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament, but rather we need to dive deeply into the Old Testament. We need to look forward by looking back, as Tim Mackey from the Bible Project talked to us about. And as we do that, we start to see that Jesus fulfills all of the promises that God gave to his people. And when we do that, when we start to make some of those connections, we catch a glimpse of God's faithfulness. And that gives us hope. We see that God keeps his promises that he will do what he says that he will do because he has done what he said that he would do. So we, as followers of Jesus, we receive this gift of hope. As we follow him, he gives us hope. But what do we mean by that? Because I can say things like, I hope the Packers win this afternoon. I really hope that the Packers win this afternoon. But what exactly do we hope for? What, when I say that, is that the same as when we talk about this gift of hope? The way that the biblical authors talk about hope and as Christians that we have hope. What exactly do we hope for? What do we hope about? We place our hope in the integrity of God. And that he will do the things that he has promised to do. Christian hope is not wishful desire. But rather confidence that God will do at least what he said that he would do. And that's, that's the most basic definition of faith. The things that God says are true about himself. About what he will do. But sometimes we'd say things like I'm believing in faith that God is going to provide this job. I'm believing in faith that God is going to provide this spouse. I'm believing in faith that God is going to fill in the blank. If God has promised you those things, then that's faith. And that is where we should place our hope. But if he hasn't promised you those things, That's presumption, not faith. You have no idea how many people I've talked to that find themselves in a a crisis of faith that say that God has failed me because of this type of talk. Because I believed in faith that God was going to whatever. 
and then God doesn't do it. The problem is that God never promised that. We presumed that God was going to do that. God will always do what he says that he will do. But he's not necessarily going to do the things that he hasn't promised to do. So we have to have an idea. We have to have a robust idea and understanding of what God has promised to do. And this, friends, this This is why it's so incredibly important for you to be engaging with your scriptures. Because otherwise you have no idea what God has promised to you and you're just presuming things. And you place your faith in those presumptions and then it doesn't happen and so suddenly it's God's fault. We have to engage with our scriptures so we can understand the things that God has promised to do and in those things we place our hope because in him we place our hope. So this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but this is a, this is a few of them, a few of the things that God has promised to us as new covenant believers. He has promised that he will never leave us He has promised that he will never leave us. He has promised that he will never forsake us or he will never disown us. That if we are his, we are his. That he has given us his spirit. That as followers of his, as blood-bought followers of Jesus, new creation, we have his spirit living inside of us. God has promised that he hears our prayers and he cares for us. He has promised eternal life to us, both in quality and in quantity. And he's promised that he's coming back. He has promised that he is making all things new, that he will wipe every tear from our eyes and that death's days are numbered. God has promised those things. Again, that's not an exhaustive list, but we have to understand the things that God has promised to us and then we hold on to those. We hold on to those for dear life. And as we wait for those promises to be fulfilled, God has given us the gift of hope. We have hope because God will do what he has promised to do. I'm going to invite the the worship team up. They're going to lead us in in a few last songs as we take communion together. This question, where's the king, is not a new question. And it's a question that we still ask today. Lord, where are you? How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Waiting can be really hard. Where's the king? Our answer to that question is to look to the cross. If you want to see the king, you look to the cross. In fact, what's really ironic is that that idea, that they, the Romans answered that question as they crucified Jesus. The Romans put a sign above his head that said, Inri, I-N-R-I. In Latin, there isn't the letter J, but it means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This bloody, beaten, crucified king, behold 
the king of the Jews. But we know that this bloody, beaten, crucified king doesn't stay on the cross. Nor does he stay in the tomb, but three days later he rises victorious over sin, death, and the devil, just as he promised. Paul, when he talks about the the people of God coming together and celebrating communion, he says, For as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until he comes, until he comes. And we know that he is coming to wipe every tear and make all things new, a new heavens and a new earth, because he promised it. So as we take the bread and the cup, with thankful hearts we remember the body and the blood of Christ and that we have freedom from our our sins today. But this is also a declaration of hope that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. We have hope that he is coming not as wishful thinking, but as confident faith that God will do what he says that he will do. Hey, thank you so much for joining us in our podcast today. Uh, If you are looking for ways to partner with us here at Community Church, you can check out our website at community-church.com.